everybody and welcome to St. Peter's, welcome to Jazz Vespers, especially if this is your very first time, a warm welcome to you. And we know that we have folks joining us on our live stream. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us from your, your living rooms. We're coming, you, coming to you live from St. Peter's Church at Lexington Avenue and 54th Street in the heart of New York City. And we hope that the next time you're in the city, you'll come and join us here in person. We found that uh, uh, there's, there's nothing like uh, seeing one another in person, there's nothing like live music. 
We're really looking forward uh, to this night. Uh, Jazz Vespers has been celebrated at St. Peter's since the 1960s to 1965, actually. And uh, it's a kind of a fusion of a, a, a traditional prayer service with, uh, with jazz. And one of the things that we do every time we, we gather at Vespers, Vespers is an old uh, church rite that is said really as the sun sets. The sun is not setting currently. But we still observe some of those rites, one of which is to light a candle in our midst uh, and I'll go to the altar here in a minute, and those of you at home, you're invited uh, perhaps to, to light a candle uh, if you have one nearby. And perhaps at home you'll say what I'll say here as I light this candle, which is God's light shines, light of life eternal. And we hear these words from the 141st Psalm, the Psalms, about 151 of them actually in the Bible if you count the extra one. And they're, they're, they're Psalms of lament, they're Psalms of joy, they're Psalms of delight, they're Psalms of longing. This Psalm was written by the Psalmist, uh, as you hear it, really at the close of the day. And it's the Psalmist settling herself, pulling herself together, thinking about uh, you'll hear, just over the entire body, and there's a sense that if anything is going to change in the world, it'll change because it first begins uh, with each and every single one of us. So you hear this psalm, Psalm 141. Let my prayer... Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the psalmist writes, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. O Lord, I call out to you. Come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. And you can hear the parts of the body here. Now, set, the, set a watch before my mouth, O Lord. Guard this door of my lips. Let not my heart be inclined to any evil thing. Let me not be occupied in mind and body and spirit with the wickedness of evildoers. But instead, turn my eyes to you, O Lord, for in you I take refuge, and you always give life. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let the incense of our prayer ascend before you, O God, and let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with hearts turned toward you and open toward one another, we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly hosts, and may glorify you forever and ever. Amen.
This is a reading from St. Matthew's Gospel. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, go without payment. To, no, to take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food.
Today we hear this story from St. Matthew's Gospel of really the commissioning of these 12 distinctive individuals. They're called apostles, which is a word in Greek which means sent. These 12 of Jesus' disciples who are sent out into the Judean countryside, to the towns and, and villages. Uh, and something about reading about those uh, towns and villages got me thinking about my own uh, town where I grew up, a little small town in the rural side, outsides of Allentown, Pennsylvania, just 70 miles uh, west of this great city. And as I thought about the town I grew up in, I realized that small towns, uh, small rural places uh, even, can teach us so many large lessons about this thing we called life. The, the town that I grew up in uh, had a, a great public high school. By the time I went off to college at Oberlin and, and graduate school at Yale, I learned that I had, what I learned was that my home, small town, public high school education could stand up to many of my classmates uh, who had gone to elite uh, private schools uh, prior to coming to college to graduate school. And one of the reasons it could do that is because the town took really seriously uh, making certain that the teachers in that public school were their own. They worked really hard to keep people in the town teaching generation after generation after generation. That was a big lesson that I learned from that small town. Another lesson I learned was that uh, in small towns like these, sports matter more than anything else. Uh, every year we'd argue about the, people would argue about the budget and it always seemed that the arts got cut but sports found all the, the, the uh, funding in the world. And I wasn't a very good athlete. In fact, most people would avoid choosing me for teams and gym. But it was interesting. I earned three so-called varsity C letters. You could earn them for academics. And I earned three of them, which was enough to get you into the varsity C club, C for the town I grew up in, called Catasauqua. Uh, but I wasn't allowed in, because none of those letters were, were earned from playing a sport. I was interested in more th in things like debate and, um, and, and student leadership activities in uh, band and in choir and in theater. In fact, as I started to think about the experience of growing up in that town, it was my participation in the theater program that resonated most with today's reading from Matthew's Gospel. You see, uh, we had a great theater program. We did all sorts of great shows, Oliver, Fiddler on the Roof, Godspell, uh, By the Skin of Our Teeth, uh, it, it, cabaret, things that uh, might be on the banned lists in certain public schools today. Uh, and it was great theater, and it was great th student-run theater. We, we built the sets, we hung the lights, we did the sound, 
We, we did the concession stands. We put the programs together. We were, of course, actors and, and, and stage managers. The whole thing was student-led. And it wasn't that the town didn't care about a theater program. In fact, there was a community-based theater program that performed uh, annually in the, another theater in the town, uh, much better equipped than my high school's theater, uh, that was always packed. They could do shows for several weeks, and uh, they completely sold out. But the high school theater program that I was a part of, largely student-run, we had about an auditorium of little over 1,000. And if it was a quarter full, that would have been a generous house count. Yet, my classmates have gone on to do some really amazing things. Many of them are teachers in public schools, teaching music or theater. My own brother-in-law is a choral arts teacher, a pretty prominent one in, in the, uh, the Lehigh Valley. Many of us, like myself, went on to careers where the arts are crucial to, to our, our lives. One of my closest friends is a head of development for one of the city's non-for-profit uh, theater companies. We've had people uh, sing on Broadway. We've had uh, classmates that have been part of this city's many choirs as a, as a paid section leader. And yet, the town really didn't show up. Not because it wasn't quality theater, but like so many things in life, people don't necessarily do what they ought to do. Jesus says to his disciples tonight, you know, go to these towns and villages. Don't don't take money along with you. Don't take extra set of clothing. Uh, when people receive you in these small towns and villages, they're going to provide for you because that's what Torah says should be done for people that are traveling about. If you live in that town, you offer hospitality to others. Uh, but if you read on, Jesus admits that's not always what happens. In fact, if you keep reading in Matthew's gospel, you find that Jesus has a pretty negative view of those small towns and villages that he sent his initial 12 uh, apostles to because they weren't treated all that well. And, and we kind of know this, right? This is, this is par for humanity's course. <clears throat> this parish, uh, throughout these next several months, is having an extra special focus on global climate change. I don't know about you, but the last couple of weeks here in New York City, uh, we very much are feeling the effects of that, breathing in all of this uh, soot and, and air pollution from the fires burning in, in Canada. And that's to say nothing about what is happening to, 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 to that land itself and to the people in the immediate vicinity who are displaced by these fires. And, and many in our community have wondered, well, what does it matter that, that, that we here at St. Peter's would do anything about global climate change? We could probably come up tonight, right, with a, a list of 10 or 12 ways in which we could dramatically change uh, the needle on global climate change. Uh, but I don't know about you, do you have any faith that our world's leaders will do anything to enact those policies? Will, will, will the great American corporations actually do that? Probably our answer is much like uh, Jesus' disciples found out in those small towns and villages all those thousands of years ago, or I found up growing up as a kid in a small town in the countryside of Pennsylvania. But that isn't really the reason why we do or do not do things, whether or not the audience shows up or whether or not we're actually provided hospitality when we go from town to town, is it? Because, of course, it's about what we learn in that process. It's the skills and the, and the passion that we all learned, I learned in that high school theater program. It's the, it's the perspective that those apostles learned when they went traveling around those small towns and villages about what it meant to be uh, human, really. And, and, and for us today, in small little ways, we do have the capacity uh, to make a difference. Some of us sit on boards and, and, and of organizations that might have substantial investments, and we could urge that that money be invested in sustainable, clean energy and resources. Or the thing that we all sort of this is very basic, is whether or not that sandwich that you're going to make to take to the office next week 
If you're going to put that in a plastic bag that you're going to toss away, or if you're going to put it into some sort of reusable container. No, my hunch is that our, our, our leaders of the world, those in, in power, are probably not going to, uh, to listen. <laughs> and they might not necessarily act if we were to come up with a 10-point plan to change global climate change tonight. But we can find ourselves informed. We can find ourselves uh, more deeply aware of what movements we should join what ways in which our voices can draw together and be amplified in the public square. That's, dear friends, why the 12 apostles are sent to the small towns and villages this night. That's why our theater programs, our music programs all across this country matter. That's why what we do every time we gather together as God's people in this place from all different walks of life, that's what makes what we do in gathering in this place matter. Because it's not about those great, grand, and large things that make the difference. But much like those small towns and villages, it's the everyday bit of our lives that can, in fact, change the world. So this night, I invite you to do a first act, perhaps, and that is to pray, to join our hearts and our minds and our thoughts in prayer for those in need, especially for this world in need. And I think in praying, we find our hearts turned outward toward others, turned outward toward Mother Earth. And we might see that in small and in large ways, we'd be able to make a difference in this world that we all call home. I'll say a few prayers from the altar, and you're invited to say a few from your own hearts, either out loud or in the silence of your hearts. And those who are praying with us at home, we invite you to pray as well, knowing that however we pray this night, God hears us. For those gathered together here in this place, and for all who form community around the world, we pray. Seek out disciples and send them out with authority to proclaim good news, bring healy, healing where there is pain, and counter the forces of evil. For the earth and all its creatures, we pray. Equip farmers, farm workers, and all who labor on the land to produce a harvest. Nourish crops with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Restore lands ruined by pollution, misuse, or fire. This week, with the World Council of Churches, we pray especially for the nations of Malawi and Zambia. For those who govern, we pray. Empower those who seek sustainable solutions to conflict and embold those who advocate for all who are oppressed. Work through systems of government, O oh God, to establish justice throughout the world. For those who suffer, we pray. Accompany those who feel helpless, alone, or abandoned. Embrace any who long for successful treatment for mental illness or freedom from addiction. Comfort those who are sick. For fathers and for father figures, we pray. Console all who long to be fathers, children estranged from their fathers, anyone grieving the death of a father, 
and fathers who have lost a child. Draw near to all for whom this day stirs up difficult emotions. Receive into your eternal care all those who have died, particularly those we name in our hearts or aloud. and fill us with hope that does not disappoint. Until at last, with Mary, Mother of God, and all your saints, we, together, we gather together at your eternal throne of grace.
Hi, everybody. Good evening. My name is James Boudreau. I'm the director of programming here at St. Peter's Church. And uh, nice to see you all here. I uh, just wanted to make a few announcements, a few introductions. Um, first of all, I don't know if you can hear this, uh, if you're joining us on our live stream, but these guys are really playing the sound of this room very beautifully um, here in person tonight. And uh, tonight on saxophone, we have David Leom. Lex Corton on piano. I was talking with a friend before the service about the um, importance of architecture on shaping an experience and how that has uh, probably gone into making this church and the jazz program what it is. And, um, you know, this is not a traditional jazz space. 
um, if you want to hear, you know, what you would think of as maybe like the traditional jazz space, you might want to put on a late 50s Charles Mingus or um, Miles Davis record from the uh, Columbia Studios, or, um, you know, go down to the Village Vanguard. These are smaller spaces. They're not as reverberant as this. But this is our space, and it's a modern space, and it's a unique space, and it's a beautiful space. And when you have um, musicians that are kind of tuned to the room, I think it can be really special um, here in person. So thank you for being here in person. I hope if you're joining us online, you can come uh, join us in person sometime. And uh, we've been doing, like Pastor Stoller said, we've been doing this here at St. Peter's since 1965, and we hope to continue it long into the future. Um, and we can only do it with your help, with the congregation's help. And if you're interested in supporting St. Peter's in this, you could do that at stpeters.org. Make a gift of any size, uh, $10 a month recurring gift or something like that, or even a one-time gift is great. We have a basket in the back uh, that you could leave something there. And if you're not in a financial position to, do, to be able to um, support the church, then consider maybe signing our guest book. Uh, which is also in the back on the table back there, because um, it's really great for the congregation and for us, for the staff, for the pastors to see who's coming and, and visiting with us. Uh, we've had people from all over the world in the last few months, and uh, it's a joy for us to see that. So uh, thanks again for being here. We have one more piece of music this evening and then a blessing from Pastor Stoller, and I wish you a good rest of your evening. Thank you.
Almighty God, who brings light and life to the whole creation, make you healers in a broken world. Send you out to be repairers of the breach. Most importantly, this night, go with determination, go in peace. Thanks be to God.